Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Wade Johannes analyzes corn and soybean markets. Richard Randall advises farmers and ranchers to be on the lookout for ergot poisoning. Tamara Jackson Zims updates us on southern rust in Nebraska cornfields. And Stephen Knezevic discusses why the state's farmers are battling resistance issues in weeds. The USDA is expecting the nation's farmers to produce 13.8 billion bushels of corn and 3.26 billion bushels of soybeans this harvest. If the projections prove true, it would be the largest corn production on record and the third largest output for soybeans. The updated planted acreage for beans led to a decrease of less than 1% from June's forecast. Nebraska is expected to produce more than 1.5 billion bushels of corn. That would keep the state as the third largest producer in the country. But Nebraska's anticipated soybean harvest of 223 million bushels would push the state down from fifth to sixth in soybean production. And if the numbers hold, Illinois would overtake Iowa in soybean output for the first time since 2003. Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with Wade Wednesday afternoon about the chances for big crops, the outlook for ethanol, and how markets responded after Monday's reports. Well, it's kind of an interesting report, Jeff, in that the uh, numbers came out smaller than expected. Um, and so we had got that initial bump. And then on Tuesday, we gave all that back and more in the corn market. Mm -hmm. Basically, there was a, uh, uh, a report in Reuters that, that said, we don't buy the numbers. And the market responded by selling off in a big way. Now here on Wednesday, the market responded back. So basically, after all the up and down, uh, we're back to square one where we started the week. Once again, we're uh, looking to see a big corn crop and weather looks to be cooperating this year. It's forecast to be the biggest on record. If that would happen, if there's around 14, maybe a, a little bit shy of 14 billion bushels, what does that do for supply and uh, is there enough demand to kind of keep prices up? Well, I think, you know, as far as you know, percent sold, farmers are way behind compared to normal just with all the things that happened in the last 12 months, and it's understandably so. The, uh, the thing is, is that you know, even with a record crop, you know, w there's been a lot of storage added nationwide, um, so it will eventually balance out, but it might take a couple of months to kind of figure out where we're at. It should be really good for ethanol. It'll be interesting to see what happens with exports, mm -hmm. if they come back right away or not. Um, and then feed will definitely load up this fall on everything they can get their hands on. Let's spend a, more, a minute more in ethanol. Uh, gas prices are forecast to be down next year and the year after. With affordable corn, what does that do for the industry overall? Well, the, the outlook for ethanol has to look really positive at this point, just with you know, crude oil trading about $100 a barrel. And uh, you know, if we have corn around $4 this fall, should look really good here for the next 12 months. You mentioned uh, where farmers were on 2013. If you had any old crop corn left that you were probably gambling with at this point, what would be the advice? Well, uh, here just a couple of weeks ago, um, nationwide, there was a huge back off in terms of cash bids uh, in corn. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it wasn't surprising that it happened, but the timing of it really was. I mean, it came in the end of July instead of the end of August when some people thought. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's gonna be very volatile between here and harvest. Everyone's just gonna try to get by one day closer to $4 corn. So um, 
you know, I would say diversify, maybe, you know, maybe divide it up into quarters and sell 25% a week just to kind of spread out your risk. And then looking at 2013, where would you be at right now and what numbers would you look at to try and sell it again? Well, we've been pushing our guys to, to get up to half sold on, on new crop corn. We're actually a little bit beyond that. And so now with the market dropping back, we don't feel the pressure to make a sale or you know, try to decide what to do. So we're comfortable sitting back a little bit and just waiting on uh, you know, making, making a, a next sale, maybe uh, you know, after we get out of harvest, December, January timeframe, figure out where we're at. With the weather sticking around like it has with uh, cooler than normal, there is a, a little bit of a warm up forecast here for the next week or two, but the weather concern that would usually play a part during the summer, certainly it did last summer, is that now maybe pushed off until a possible freeze as you look at corn and beans? Yeah, that's one of the the last bullish cards left in the deck. Um, if, if we do get that early freeze for corn and for soybeans, I know that we are ahead of 2009 in terms of GDUs. Uh, so, you know, we're a little bit ahead of that year when we did get affected by that early frost. Um, but that, you know, is probably going to uh, affect soybeans just as much because soybeans were planted uh, mostly in June this year. So um, if we have just a normal freeze, yeah, it could play in on overall supply. Right now, as it stands, this forecast to be the third largest soybean crop on record. But the interesting thing is that what's happening down in Brazil, they're forecasted to uh, produce a huge crop this next year. What does that do for overall supply and possibly uh, price as well? Yeah, one uh, private analyst this morning, I, I just read a, a, a news wire that said that uh, they estimate that South America could produce 10% more than last year. And last year, South America produced a record crop. So, um, you know, that's probably the optimistic side of it, but yet, um, you know, it's going to take a major issue if they're projecting higher than a record crop uh, to uh, um, uh, get, bring things back to normal. So it should uh, probably keep a lid on the soybean market worldwide here for the next 12 months. Thoughts on uh, if you have any old crop left and then maybe looking at that new crop as well. For soybeans, um, you know, we actually had a, about a 50, 60 cent bounce here since the report on Monday. So, um, you know, if you if you haven't been making sales lately, you know, if we can get a $12 cash for this fall, I would probably make another 10% sale. Um, but still, diversify and, and spread out your risk. Are you at all sold on a 2014 corn or soybeans? Yeah, we're sitting about 25% uh, sold on corn, a little bit less on soybeans, but uh, once again, just looking at locking in profit margin, and then by doing so, it takes a little bit more pressure off of when you make your next sale. Next week, we'll look at cattle markets with Jim Robb from the Livestock Marketing Information Center. UNL Extension Beef Veterinarian Richard Randall talked with us this week about a potential problem in Nebraska's grasses. Reports across the Midwest show cattle suffering from ergot poisoning. All animals are susceptible to ergot, but cattle are most often affected. And ideal weather for the problem may match the conditions this state experienced earlier in the year. So ergot poisoning is a problem caused by a fungus that invades seed heads of certain grasses under certain climatic conditions. What kind of grasses are you typically finding this on? So usually it can be several grasses and cereal grains. Rye is a common, uh, uh, commonly infected, but it can affect smooth brome, uh, wheat, barley, uh, wheat grass, any number of grasses can be affected if the climatic conditions are right. Why is it a concern for a beef producer? The fungus produces uh, a substance that causes problems with the uh, uh, cardiovascular system. So it causes the small blood vessels on the periphery of the body to constrict very severely, basically shutting off blood flow to certain areas of the body. Uh, so it can cause, depending on uh, dosing and timing, it can cause uh, uh, multiple effects just from the standpoint of uh, interrupting uh, appropriate blood flow. There have been some problems. How widespread have they been? So we've been seeing reports coming in from all across the Midwest this, uh, this spring and summer. Uh, and recently, there's been a couple of reports in Nebraska of some cattle suspected of, of having ergot poisoning. Is there any survivability to it, or uh, is it 100% uh, mortality? Yeah, no. Typically, uh, if we recognize the signs early and remove them from the, from the source of the, the toxins, uh, if they're not too far advanced, they can, uh, they typically can uh, uh, turn around and, and overcome it. Uh, the types of things that you'd see, again, basing on, on the level of uh, infection that the cattle get, 
uh, certain things like the uh, tips of ears or the tips of tails may uh, drop off from lack of circulation. Uh, as it gets a little worse, uh, often you'll see feed involvement. So we can see some lameness in cattle. Uh, we can see some swelling around the tops of the hooves moving all the way up uh, uh, to the fetlocks. And it typically more commonly affects rear legs. So uh, in worst case scenarios, you could see fetlocks beginning to swell. Uh, and, and if severe enough, you can actually see some loss of some, some hooves. What should a farmer or rancher be looking for, and if uh, he or she finds it, what do they need to do? Well, the ergot typically confines itself to seed head. So what happens if we have, a, if we have like we had in Nebraska uh, earlier this year, at least in parts of Nebraska, uh, an area of cool wetness early spring followed by some pretty significant heat, uh, then that fungus will invade those seed heads, uh, and, uh, and that's where they sit and produce their toxins. If you were examining a field, for example, where the grass was allowed to mature to the point where you see the, where they have seed heads, you can examine that and those uh, fungal elements will typically be a, a dark brown, purplish to black uh, replacement of the normal seed head. Um, and if that's the case, uh, then it's a, it's a possibility that it could be there in significant enough levels to, uh, uh, you know, to cause a problem. Richard says you should examine grass in pasture or hay to determine if the fungus is present. Since the fungus is in the seed head, grass that's developed can be clipped before allowing cattle to graze it. If hay was delayed due to wetness, Richard says it should be looked over as well. The 2013 Nebraska State Fair opens Friday, August 23rd at its home in Grand Island. It'll be the fourth straight year for the fair at Fawner Park. You can learn all about the events of the State Fair in the August Nebraska Farmer. The theme for 2013 is the thrill of it all. This month's magazine says August 29th is the day to be there if you're in the beef industry. It'll be Nebraska Cattlemen's Day, beginning with breed shows, a Supreme Champion Beef Cattle Drive, and a barbecue. This year's fair runs through September 2nd. You can find all the ag-related events and shows in the Nebraska Farmers August issue. Southern rust continues to affect more Nebraska counties. UNL Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zims spoke with us earlier this week about scouting, treating, and the severity of the disease in this state. This week, I think we're up to about 20 counties or so where we have confirmed southern rust in them. Now, that's not to say that eastern and south central Nebraska are the only places where southern rust is. It's likely in many more areas of the state. In those areas that you have seen it, how severe is it? Well, in some parts of the state where we've been watching it and it hasn't been doing much and hasn't changed much over the last two weeks, we are starting to see it increase rapidly. There are some areas, say, in uh, eastern Nebraska as well as south central where they're noticing rapid increases. And so now is what we have been concerned about and we want to emphasize that they need to be out scouting and being prepared to make a management decision if they need to. We've seen some cool weather over the last few weeks, at least cool compared to normal. Now the extended forecast does show some heat moving in. What could that uh, maybe allow in some of these fields? Well, southern rust is more of a warm season disease, and so the optimal temperatures for southern rust are in the upper 70s and lower 80s. We've been pretty cool and had cool nighttime temperatures. That's probably worked in our favor to keep that disease at bay for now. Well, with the warmer temperatures and we've still got the high humidity and, and rainfall and light sprinkles, we've got the moisture, this is leading into a situation where we could have an increase in the disease now. And what are the management decisions to make there on whether to spray or whether not to spray? Well, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Not only the disease in your field and what you're seeing develop in your area, they need to take into consideration the stage that the corn is at. And so obviously when you get toward the end of the season and getting into late dough and into dent, it's too late to do anything about it. That's why it's important to have the fungicide application made before that time and to protect that last grain fill period, like the dough stage. Uh, any other problems that you're seeing in fields, stock or out of problem, anything like that? Well, that's certainly something to think about. So if southern rust does become a big problem in some of these fields, it takes away leaf area and the stalks can actually be cannibalized and it could lead to quite a bit of stalk rot this fall. Not to mention all the hail events that we've had that I think we'll be visiting about more in the coming weeks. There has been some hail damage uh, stripped through central Nebraska. What are some of the things that uh, would be concerning about that? 
Well, the hail and the wind damage, of course, causes significant wounding to these plants. And wounds of any kind are going to be allowing pathogens to infect the plants. And so, of course, we have to think about goss's wilt. That's a perennial problem for us now in Nebraska. And so scouting for goss's wilt and knowing whether or not you've got it will help you make seed selection decisions this fall for next year or in two years when you're thinking about what hybrids to plant. In addition, though, this time of the year, we need to talk about what those uh, wounds and other things are going to, how they're going to impact the corn. And so things like stalk rot diseases are certainly something to think about, and especially ear rot diseases. I want people to be aware this time of year that ear rot diseases can get started. And so all those bruises and wounds are just open doors for those fungi that are in every field. They may notice some of these fungi when they peel back the husk and look when they're making their preliminary scouts. Uh, that can have long-term impacts as far as and decisions that need to be made about how they're going to handle that grain and what could happen to it during storage. You can keep an eye on the CropWatch website for updated corn disease information from Tamra towards the end of each week. You can also read Bruce Anderson's recommended options if you're interested in using damaged corn as a forage source. We'll link to that article on the Market Journal homepage. The most expensive setback for Nebraska soybean growers is soybean cyst nematode. It's been identified in 54 Nebraska counties and has been found as far west as McCook. Starting next week, producers will have the opportunity to gather information about the issue at SCN Management Field Days in the state. UNL Extension plant pathologist Lauren Giesler explains how you'll learn more about this multi-million dollar problem. Well, we've been doing the soybean cyst nematode management field days for the last six years, and uh, this year we're going to be covering some of those same topics, um, provide some more updated information, uh, some research updates, and then we'll share the data from the last few years of what we've been doing. Uh, with each field day, uh, the growers that come, they get a complimentary uh, soil sampling set so they can have as many bags as they'd like to test their fields, and really we want to increase awareness for cyst nematode management. We estimate that last year uh, soybean producers just in Nebraska contributed over $45 million in lost revenue to so due to soybean cyst nematode. This is a problem that most of the time you can't really see and it's kind of that what we call a silent yield robber, you know, taking an average of five to six bushels per acre if growers or farmers are growing susceptible soybean varieties. The field days begin Wednesday, August 21st in Waverly and then move to Madison on Thursday, August 22nd. The following week will feature field days in Peru on Tuesday, August 27th and in Herman Wednesday, August 28th. The Soybean Cyst Nematode Management Field Days are presented by UNL Extension with support from the Nebraska Soybean Board. We'll link to more information through our website or you can contact your local UNL Extension office. In our previous episode, Lowell Sandell discussed glyphosate resistance in Nebraska weeds. While in David City for the Herbicide Resistant Weed Management Field Day last week, we also sat down with Stephen Knezvik to talk about how farmers should attack weeds with resistance and how we developed this problem in the first place. I'm pretty much tempted to say uh, that we've been using Roundup way too much. Uh, Roundup Ready soybeans came on market just uh, 15, 16 years ago, corn about six, seven years ago. And basically we are rotating two crops where we're using the same chemistries. And uh, after use and what I call literally a misuse of Roundup, spraying and spraying and spraying. And we do more of that in soybeans than in corn. Uh, basically, we're beginning to sh see uh, weeds showing up resistance. Uh, you know, right now we have only four species in our state. Some other states will have a, as much as six or seven species. Overall, there's 12 uh, nationwide and 25 worldwide, simply because of the overuse of Roundup. That's pretty much a, you know, a take home message out of this is, come on guys, we've got to do something else. We got to, I mean, Roundup is a fantastic chemical. It's a one in a hundred year discovery. We want to save Roundup for our kids and grandkids. And we can still use Roundup if we, um, if we start using less of it. And I don't mean lower rates. I mean, using fewer applications, maybe just one shot a year and then start using other herbicides and other modes of actions. And that's the only way to slow down this resistance. Do you think farmers understand the importance or the, the severity of what's happening? I think that they do understand. It's really hard to give up this tool that it's so simple to use. And it's relatively inexpensive now with generic glyphosate, you know, where you can have a shot of glyphosate for five, six bucks. 
it's really hard to beat that price, you know. And then you hear guys like me telling you use other herbicides, and any other option is going to cost you anywhere from 30 to maybe even 50 bucks. And some guys that have resistance, they're spending hundred dollars per acre, and they're not controlling the weeds. So it's like that's your spectrum. You can continue Roundup cheap, cheap, and cheap, and it works for you. And I know it works in a lot of fields, but then. What are you going to do when it stopped working? You took that mode of action out of the picture completely and then you're going to spend some major, major money. And once Roundup develops in these plants, it just stays in the plants. It doesn't go away. It stays in that population. We've seen that a lot of places now with Roundup is not killing weeds. We're trying to use triazines in corn, like atrazine type uh, herbicides, and atrazine is not killing them. So that means those are atrazine or triazine resistant weeds. Well, now they just added a glyphosate resistance to it. And then in soybeans, they've been using Pursuit or Scepter or Raptor or try to use some of those chemistries to kill the weeds that Roundup doesn't kill. Well, guess what? They're not working either because a lot of those weeds, I'm not saying all the weeds, but many of them are ALS resistant. So there you are now on your field. You don't have ALS, uh, uh, ALS tools to use. You don't have triazine tools to use. You don't have Roundup tool to use. So you're out of three modes of actions. And that's what we have in Nebraska. We do have uh, water hemp populations that have a resistance to all these three chemistries. And it's not widespread. It's sporadic. But this is the time to get on the top of the game. If you have resistant weeds in your field, what's the key to controlling them? Depending on what kind of resistance right. is it, obviously you got to determine what one is it, and then you got to open up the weed guide for weed control in Nebraska. We have a herbicides mode of action groups in there, which is, I believe, on page eight. We ranked all these weeds and grouped them by different modes of actions. And then you go to herbicides efficacy tables in the guide and you choose your herbicides based on the mode of action. So if you have resistance to three modes of actions, obviously you got to use the herbicides that has mode of action four or five that will give you a control. But I don't think that you even want to be on that boat where you have three types of resistance on your farm. The portion of the 2013 weed guide Stephen mentioned can be found on our website at marketjournal.unl.edu. Now with an extended weather outlook as well as this week's forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. We have had uh, off and on thunderstorm activity for the better part of this last week. In particular, the area that received the most generous moisture was portions of the Sand Hill through central and south into portions of south central Nebraska as successive waves on a daily basis rolled out of the Dakotas and moved south and southeastward toward the southern plains. And we've seen those same lines running over the same areas. And in fact, until we got into late Wednesday night into Thursday, it didn't seem like the precipitation could get any farther east there than a line from about York uh, eastward. That area was receiving nothing in the way of significant moisture. And then of course we've seen the frontal boundary pass through and we got some decent moisture across portions of northeast and east central Nebraska, particularly along the Missouri River Basin where we desperately needed it. But in the same token, we have seen this area completely degrade over the last 30 to 45 days in response to below normal precipitation. And the improving conditions have been showing up more in the central and western part of the state through these excessive storm systems that have moved through. And in fact, over this last week, in the central Sand Hills region, particularly as you get into that Thedford area, some locations received an excess of four inches. And I think the highest total that I've seen over this last seven day period was a little over five inches in the Dunning area. So we welcome the moisture. There's a lot more that's gonna be needed in order to completely alleviate the drought. And certainly we need to see our team some pickup and precipitation across eastern Nebraska. So let's take a perspective of what all of this means in regards to the drought monitor. And the latest drought monitor that goes through Tuesday morning is indicating the expansion of dryness in through the eastern part of Nebraska. And also you're starting to see that materialize in Iowa. And we're starting to see abnormal dryness spreading into the northern corn belt in response to below normal precipitations. And we're seeing the improving conditions across uh, the central sand hills and then some a limited improvement across the panhandle. Now, when we enter the spring, almost 90% of the state was either in D4 or D3 conditions, exceptional or extreme drought. We're now down to about 20% of the state that is now in extreme drought. We've basically removed almost all the exceptional drought. 
And so we are seeing the improving conditions and it's going to take considerably more moisture for us to uh, get the rid of the remainder portion of this drought, but at least we're seeing improvements. Now, if we look at the result of this, we've been seeing a persistent cold pattern. We've had that upper air trough that's sitting over southern Canada that's been rotating energy around and kept us exceptionally cold. We're running three to five degrees below normal for the last 30 day period. And that's probably helped us somewhat because it's really very dry conditions that have developed most of Iowa, eastern Nebraska, and points to our east. Has really has a concern in regards to what it may do to yields, and I think the cool conditions have helped alleviate the real detrimental conditions that may have ever existed if we'd had similar temperature conditions as we did last summer. So as we go forward, and this would be from today through the next week, we're going to be looking for thunderstorm activity, but there's really not a lot on the horizon. We're going to start to see that ridge build in. You can see that a big upper air trough has kind of moved out of the picture. We're seeing a trough moving into the Pacific Northwest, and ridging pattern is going to be the dominant feature at least through the good portion of this week. So we're not expecting any precipitation today. We expect to start to warm up rather dramatically and it will be persistent th through the week as this ridge slowly expands eastward. And you can see that we're basically the ridge is centered over the southern Rockies and it's going to be pushing out into the central plains and as we get into Monday we'll see that ridge expanding into the central corn belt. As we get into Tuesday we'll notice that it envelops the entire corn belt and all the main energy remains up in the Dakotas and to our north. As we get into Wednesday there is that trough starting to move in, so we might get an isolated thunderstorm developing in the panhandle. A little bit better chance as we get into the day Thursday as that energy gets a little bit closer, but most of eastern Nebraska remains high and dry. And then as we get into Friday, that trough slips in a little bit farther, and there is an indication that we might break out some precipitation. So for the temperature forecast, pretty consistent. We're going to be remaining into the uh, upper night or lower 90s across most of western Nebraska, and uh, eight, upper 80s to low 90s across eastern Nebraska. So we go to the 8 to 14 day forecast. That ridge stays in place at least to the end of the month, and in terms of precipitation with that ridge, of course, we do expect drier than normal conditions. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews with Wade Johannes, Richard Randall, Tamara Jackson Zims, Lauren Giesler, and Stephen Knezevic are available individually as part of the August 16th episode of Market Journal on our website and through the Market Journal mobile app. Next week, we'll report from the 2013 Goodmanson Sandhills Lab open house near Whitman, where Jim Robb will be our cattle market analyst. We'll also show you interviews from the recent soybean management field days. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily and soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.